Okay. So the goal of this afternoon's lecture is to describe the leading order behavior of, uh, let's say, minimizers. But it's not going to be only for minimizers. It's, only going it's also going to be valid for uh, situations with temperature. Um, but let's forget for now um, the probabilistic aspects. Let's think just of this energy. And, and so I want to describe the connection to what's called the equilibrium measure, which I uh, alluded to this morning. So when you look at this energy, uh, you can think of trying to put it in a integral form, uh, something like this, double integral. So n squared, you factor out n squared. And you want to uh, rewrite it as, uh, in terms of the empirical measure, plus Okay, so this is in Rd cross Rd, and this is here in Rd. And mu and hat is the empirical measure. I remind you it's defined like this. And xi here are just arbitrary points in Rd. Okay, so this looks uh, credible, right? You replace these by the Dirac's, you multiply by n squared. There is one one place where this is wrong, which is that uh, it ignores this issue of the self-interactions. So here, you have to remove i equals j, because when i equals j, you would get g of 0. And in most cases, we're interested in g of 0 is infinity, so there's an infinite self-interaction. And here, it's not uh, accounted for. So if I want to do it properly, I remove here this triangle. So this is not for the Laplacian. This is for the, the diagonal. Okay, so this is the diagonal of Rd cross Rd. But okay, let's think in a, a little bit formally for now. We're going to jump from there to defining a functional on all probability measures. So in some sense, we relax the problem. In think, instead of thinking of empirical measures only, we're going to think of probability measures and define this thing. We're now integrate in Rd cross Rd, not removing the diagonal. And then here in Rd over, so mu now is in the space of probability measures on Rd. Okay? So for, for a moment, we're just going to jump from here to there, and then we'll make the rigorous connection uh, uh, later. But just think of this functional as a function of mu, a probability density. So first of all, you can see that this thing has a chance of making sense because, because g is integrable near the diagonal or near the origin. So when x tends to y, if I put here um, an absolutely continuous uh, density, this is going to be integrable. So, so there are measures such that this is finite. Okay? The other thing uh, you can see, so this is, this is what's called the potential case. So what I'm going to describe now is, is actually the basics of potential theory. The fact that S is less than D means that, OK, this thing is, is finite, and that's the potential case. The other thing you can observe is that this function is convex as a function of mu. In fact, it's even, you can even show it's strictly convex. As a function of mu. So there's a part here that's uh, just uh, linear. But here, this part is quadratic. A and if you want to check that it's strictly convex, you really have to use the, the form of g, the particular uh, shape of g. And one way of seeing it is it's because the Fourier transform of g has a sign. So this is proven in the notes. I, I won't, you know, it's not worth like dwelling on it, but just to mention, it's, it's strictly convex, so that's very nice. This is in contrast with the original uh, energy here, which as a function of xn is very non-convex. 
has many minima, local minima. In fact, it has a, an energy landscape which is complex as n goes to infinity. And I think one of the a very interesting question, but uh, very out of reach, is, is to really try to describe this complexity, like like people do in you know complexity of spin glasses, for instance. But there's no Gaussian thing that you can play with. But, but anyway, so you have to imagine this thing as, as a very very rough landscape. However, when n goes to infinity, you find yourself with something almost trivial, right? Some something convex. Um, so as a result, if E has a minimizer, it's going to be unique. And now let's justify that it has a minimizer. So E has a minimizer under uh, suitable assumptions. And I'm going to list uh, some that work for you. So A1, um, V is lower, semi-continuous, and bounded below. So that seems fairly reasonable. A2, you need this growth at infinity, I told you, in order to confine things. So uh, here what you need is that V plus G tends to infinity as X goes to infinity. Um, now, this is not very demanding because if you remember, you know, so G is what it's 1 over S x to the minus s or minus log x. Okay, so as soon as s is positive, this function goes to zero at infinity. So, so really you're not, you're only asking something about v. You're only asking that v goes to infinity. But if s is not positive, so for instance when s is zero or when s is negative, then this function tends to minus infinity at infinity, and so you need to you need v to grow faster than that to compensate uh, as x goes to infinity. And there's going to be to, there's going to be a third assumption, uh, which is that v is finite. V is finite on a set of positive capacity. And okay, now you have to ask, what is a set of positive capacity? It's a set that can sustain um, a measure with finite energy. So it means there exists. So a set is of positive capacity. So non-zero in particular. I'm not going to define capacity itself, but you can. Positive capacity if there exists mu, so a set, let's say k, there exists mu, a probability supported on k, and such that the double integral gx minus y d mu of x d mu of y is finite. Okay, so just to, to give an example, a point is not a set of positive capacity because if you want to find a probability measure supported at a point, there's only a Dirac mass. If you put a Dirac mass here, this thing is not finite. Okay, so positive capacity means uh, the thing is a little bit extended. So it, yeah. No, on the whole, on the. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. That's why you don't want your measure to charge infinity. You, you, you want. Ah, yeah, yeah. I meant here. I meant here. Uh, B zero one. Yeah. This is about zero. Uh, this is this is about the diagonal. I'm not talking about the infinity. Okay. Okay. So so truncate. Uh, okay, truncate in some some sort of bar like this. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, Fourier, Fourier, Fourier transform. Oh, okay. Yeah. But what has to do the Fourier transform of V with E? Okay, so a good question. I will show you. So let's do it on the side here. 
So if you, if you look at this, you can think of this as a convolution. So you can think of this as the integral of g convolved with mu d mu. Right, you're in the standard stance of convolution, so you take this, you know. Okay, so now do that. And now you know Parseval's theorem about Fourier transforms, right? So this is equal to the integral of the Fourier transform of this times the Fourier transform of mu. So I, I, by the way, I always use mu for the measure or for its density. Okay, I use the same notation. And now you know the Fourier transform of a convolution. It's the product. So it's going to be Fourier of g and then Fourier of mu squared. Okay, and now here uh, you see that at least it's a sufficient condition if the Fourier transform is positive. You're going to have a sign for this and this is, this is a, a quadratic, a positive quadratic function. So this is where the Fourier transform is convenient. Uh, but there's other ways of defining this. There's a, uh, there's a sort of theory of uh, of such uh, positive definite uh, f functions that are equivalent to a Fourier condition. But I, I, I just wanted to say on the side here, if you want to just look at these particular Gs, they happen to have positive Fourier transform. This one, this these ones, yes, yeah, these Gs have positive Fourier transform. So you have to compute the Fourier transform in a generalized sense because these are not uh, smooth functions, right? Mm -hmm. But there is a theory, you know, for Schwartz, uh, Schwartz distributions and uh, you can have even a formula for the Fourier transform. It's also an inverse power. Okay, so the Fourier transform of one over X to the S is actually one over C to the d minus s, and there's, a, there's some constants here that depend on d and s. But the, the, the Fourier transform inverse power is another inverse power, and you see how it, the power changes. Um, and then there is a little something else, but with that you can conclude. Um, okay, now in any case, you could, you could uh, try to study more general things than these g's. And you would see that what you need is really positivity of the Fourier transform. At least it's, it's a sufficient condition for the same story to, to happen. Okay, no problem. Okay, so I was trying to say that a set of positive capacity is a set that has a little bit of extension. Um, it doesn't have to have an interior, however. So uh, an example of a set of positive capacity uh, for these uh, particular uh, interactions, you can, take a, you can take a piece of curve, for instance, or a circle. Right? You can find measures supported on a circle for which this thing is convergent. Um, however, the circle has no interior. Okay, so, so a set of, capa of zero capacity is small. It's always measure zero. So zero capacity is if you don't have positive capacity. Okay, so the set of zero capacity has measure zero, but not the, the converse is not true. So you could have sets that have measure zero, but that still uh, can support uh, can support a, a measure. When you measure zero, it's the back measure. Yes, the back measure zero. Okay, but in any case, just think if you want, just take a function v that takes only finite values. Then you don't have to worry about this. However, it's interesting to have this uh, general setup because, uh, so this problem, the problem of minimizing E, as I told you, it's a basic of potential theory. In fact, it's, it's an electrostatic problem. And it was first studied by Gauss, so it's a very old problem. And the question you ask, you know, when G is the electrostatic interaction, so like Coulomb, uh, the question you ask is, uh, it's called the capacitor problem. Well, one of the questions you can ask is to minimize uh, the same thing. Uh, where mu is supported in some set K. 
Okay, so you give yourself a, a domain, that's k, and you want to minimize this. Well, that's equivalent to minimizing e and with the choice that v is plus infinity outside of k. So it means, basically, you cannot put charges outside of k. k is not allowed. Uh, uh, the complement of k has to be empty of charges. Mu is a density of charge, right? Uh, so if you try to minimize with plus infinity in the complement, well, if you put any charge outside of, the, of k, you will get plus infinity from this term. So it's a, it's a constraint. It becomes a constraint that mu has to be supported not on the whole space, but only on, our, uh, only on k. And so that's why it's interesting to handle possibly plus infinity values for, for your potential. Okay, but however, the, the set has to be big enough that it can sustain a charge. So, under these three assumptions, there is a minimizer. So that's, the, that's what this classical theory tells you. And I'm going to try to state the theorem after I manage this tricky business. So now I will wait a little bit so that it dries. <laughs> if you have questions in the meantime, it's a good, good moment. So there's going to be a theorem that was uh, first proved by uh, Frostman. So it's uh, from the 50s, I think, 1950s. That says that under these assumptions, for, for the Gs I consider, but in for, even for a broader class of Gs, um, there is a unique minimizer, and that's called the equilibrium measure. I guess I'll Can you see now? A unique minimizer called equilibrium measure or Frostman equilibrium measure. It is compactly supported, so that's part of the result. And it has a unique characterization <laughs> So basically if you want yeah uh, do you need any continuity of g So I am stating it for my particular g's so those, that g is well it's continuous except at the origin uh, if you want to make a general uh, theory, you're going to have to put assumptions. Yeah, so I mentioned the Fourier transform. You're going to have to make some, um, some sort of assumptions that you can have singularities, but not too many. But I don't want to get into that level of uh, generality here. OK, so what's the characterization? The characterization is what you get when you you write basically the Euler-Lagrange equation associated to this convex minimization problem. And the equation is this. So I'm going to define, so first we're going to call it mu ec, like equilibrium measure. I'm going to define what this means, h mu ec plus v. So there exists a constant c such that this thing is bigger than c 
everywhere. Let's say quasi everywhere. And it's equal to C on the support of mu x. And what is H mu? So for any mu, I'm going to use this notation many times. So H mu means the potential generated by mu. It's defined as the convolution of G with mu, or if you prefer, the integral. OK, so again, from the point of view of physics, or here, electrostatics, mu is a distribution of charge. When you have a charge distribution, you have an electric potential, which is, um, if G is Coulomb, it's defined like that. And if it's not Coulomb, you can still call that a risk potential. And so the characterization tells you that the equilibrium distribution is the one which is such that the electric potential, the self-induced electric potential, if you want, plus the outside potential, which is the total potential. So, right, so this is, this is the sort of total potential. You have the self-induced plus the external is constant on the support of the charge. This is when you're at equilibrium, yeah? So is there also a probabilistic interpretation of you as the, as the measure of when I take a market force and I stop those in the uh, uh, or not? There might be. Yeah, yeah. There might be, but I will confess one thing to you, which I'm not a probabilist. <laughs> it's time you know this now. <laughs> So I, 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 I don't know of a probabilistic interpretation, but it sounds like a plausible thing. Maybe you have to take maybe some, it should be like a volume motion, and you, you take a stop in time. Yeah, 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 yeah. But so, uh, it depends on G, right? And, and so I think this would be a, you know, the obstacle problem, it's, a, it's, it's always, I know the time dependent stuff, you, you put a stopping time, you get a time dependent. So, so I think this thing also has one, yes. Okay. Uh, I just couldn't uh, bring it out to you right now. Okay. But yes. Yeah. Mm. So, so your note you write like QE, what does it mean? Like the, the abbreviation? So it means quasi everywhere. And quasi everywhere means except on a set of capacity zero. So I've, I've, def I've defined for you just before what it means to be capacity zero. It's too small to, to support a charge. Uh, and so quasi everywhere, it's something that's a bit stronger than almost everywhere. But again, uh, okay, uh, for the purposes of this course, it's not a detail that's so important, but this is a precise definition. And here also it's quasi everywhere. Okay, so it's, it's a bit more than almost everywhere. Okay, so the constant C is implicit. It's, it's, you can determine it from the problem. There's a unique one, uh, and that's the thing. So note, uh, remark, if you take this case where that I was considering before, V equals plus infinity in the complement of K, and sorry, equals zero in K that I was mentioning before, that, that's the capacitor problem for the set K. Uh, then you see what you find, you find that uh, H mu X is going to be constant in the support of K. Uh, and well, that's pretty much it. Um, yeah. So, so maybe from now we can, we can deduce some uh, some examples, we can look at some important examples. So the Coulomb case, I told you that's the most important thing. So what's special about the Coulomb case is that G, remember, is the fundamental solution to the Laplacian. So H mu, in fact, 
which is the convolution of G with mu, is up to a constant, the inverse Laplacian of mu. So in other words, so it's a, there is a constant which I call CD. In other words, if you take minus Laplacian of H mu, you find mu up to uh, this multiplicative constant. OK? So if the support of the equilibrium measure has an interior, so let's imagine that, uh, OK, this is the support of the equilibrium measure. Let's imagine that there is a, we're at an interior point. At an interior point, this thing will be constant. I can differentiate this relation. Right? So this is going to be constant here. H mu x plus V equals constant. I can differentiate this relation. Actually, I can take the Laplacian of this relation point-wise. So take Laplacian. What you find is you find that minus Laplacian of H mu x, so it's CD times mu x minus Laplacian of V, and the Laplacian of the constant is 0. OK, so what you obtain is that the equilibrium measure is equal to Laplacian V over CD in the interior of its support. So I'm going to call sigma the support. So that's going to be a, a notation that's going to be used throughout. So let's introduce it. This is the interior. So if you have an interior point, you can take this Laplacian, and you find the density is proportional to the Laplacian of the potential. So that, of course, works if the potential is sufficiently differentiable. Right? So if I have a potential which is C2, for instance, I can apply this formula. Um, so that's interesting. However, it doesn't fully tell us what mu x is because we don't know the support. Mm -hmm. So here what we deduce is that mu x, the x should be downstairs, is equal somehow to this times the indicator function of this set sigma, which I still don't know what it is. I mean, I don't have a formula for sigma in general. Um, but if you happen to know that your problem is rotationally symmetric, so for instance, if V is x squared, I told you that's an important example. So in particular, if V of x is, let's say, x squared, then you can argue by uniqueness of this thing and characterization that the equilibrium measure also will have this rotational or spherical symmetry. And so if it has spherical symmetry and it's compactly supported, it has to be supported in a ball. Uh, and so now I'm starting to know. And what is the Laplacian of x squared? It's a constant. OK, so then mu equilibrium, I'm going to be able to say it's the indicator function of a certain ball of a certain radius. Uh, and well, it has to be a probability measure, so we know that you can have to normalize by the volume of the ball. OK, and this R you can compute. There's a formula depending on the dimension. OK, so in the particular case of Coulomb, so this is Coulomb, and this is rotationally symmetric, we have an explicit form of the equilibrium measure, which is just a uniform distribution in a ball. Okay, so we, found, we knew that it was going to be a ball, and th this thing gave us the density, which is uniform. You can also do it with uh, other quadratic functions. You'll get uh, distributions in an ellipse, uh, things like that. So this is one of the few cases where we have an explicit form. Um, and this is, this is very nice. You, you can think of this as the model case, if you want. Okay? So this is the model, something compactly supported with a nice density on its support. But note that the, the density itself is discontinuous. It's going to jump, right? It's going to be an indicator function of a ball. So it's going to be 1, and then suddenly jump to 0. And this corresponds to the circle law in random matrix theory. 
So in random matrices, uh, when I told you about the Ginib ensemble this morning, we knew that the eigenvalues uh, are somewhere in the complex plane where they're going to end up being distributed according to this equilibrium measure. And what is this in the plane? Well, this is a disk. Okay, and so it's called the circle law. It should be called the disk law, but it's, it's, the, it's the, the thing that says that eigenvalues will be uniformly distributed in a, in a disk. There is one other case of equilibrium measure which is, uh, which is uh, also quite standard. It's the logarithmic case in 1D. Okay, so if you look at the log case in 1D, it's no longer a Coulomb uh, situation. But if V is quadratic, you also have a formula for it. So this is the time where I wait. You can ask questions. Yeah. Here you're taking a radial distribution exponential. Mm -hmm. What happens if it's not convex anymore? Do you still have a con convex for the, the support of the measure? Do you have a hole in it? Oh, the, 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 you can ha totally have a hole. There's examples with holes. Uh, it can have multiple connected components. Uh, yeah, so people have studied things like that. When you start to, for instance, you can take the quadratic and add a quartic perturbation and you try to move your parameter and you will see the moment where the hole appears. You can certainly play with things like that. Now you cannot, okay, if you want some sort of general theory, it's a bit uh, more subtle. So I will, I will tell you that in a minute, in fact, that one of the uh, good ways of looking at this problem is to think of it in terms of another problem from calculus of variations, which is called the obstacle problem. And this gives you a, a number of results and intuition on it. But, um, but let me just first finish with that. Uh, other questions in that direction? But all things are possible, yes. Multiple things, holes, etc. Uh, so. Another example, as I said, is the 1D log situation with V quadratic. And then, in that case, it is known that mu x has, uh, is a measure with the density whose graph is a uh, semicircle. So it's this famous semicircle law, which is, uh, what is it, something like this. Right, so it's supported in minus two, two. And, and the measure density does this. So this is the semicircle law, it's or Wigner's semicircle law. So Wigner was the first one who said that if you take the eigenvalues of these, uh, for instance, Hermitian um, GUE matrices, the eigenvalues should distribute with a histogram that looks like that. Okay, so you're going to have most eigenvalues between minus 2 and 2, and a peak at 0, etc. So the semicircle law comes up in many, many things. But, but here it can be computed as the equilibrium measure for, for this particular case. OK, so that's the theorem. Um, I'm not going to give you the full proof, but I want to give you a few ingredients of what are the main points. Hmm? OK, so how do you prove that something has a unique minimizer? So first of all, you're going to have to prove that the infimum of E is not minus infinity. And that is guaranteed for you by, um, by various things in the assumptions. But one of the things that is very useful is to observe that G of X minus Y plus V of X plus V of Y um, yeah, I think it's this one. This thing, not only it's bounded below, but it tends to infinity at infinity.
and, and in all the G cases that I described. So this comes from looking a little bit at what G is and using assumption two. Remember assumption two tells you that V beats G at infinity. So when you put them together and you, okay, it's in the notes. So what you can do is you can rewrite the energy in terms of that function, right? E of mu, you can rewrite it as one half double integral. And here you can put G X minus Y plus V of X plus V of Y. So you sort of artificially double the variables for the V things. And you write it as a double integral like that. And so now that you see that this thing is bounded below and goes to infinity, it, it's going to tell you that the thing is bounded below. So the infimum is not minus infinity. And it's also going to tell you that you shouldn't put mass far away. Because if you put mass outside of a compact set, you can make this thing as large as you want. OK, so what you do, as always, when you want to prove existence of a minimizer, is you take a minimizing sequence. right? <laughs> so you're going to find mu n such that e of mu n tends as little n goes to infinity to the infimum. Now we, we've seen that this infimum is not minus infinity. We can find guys such that this thing is bounded independently of little n. Why? Precisely because uh, we can make a measure for which this whole thing is finite. That's thanks to A3, because A3 tells us you can find places where V is not plus infinity and which can support some mass in such a way that the self-interaction is not plus infinity. So you can make something non plus infinity. So this, this thing comes from A3. Uh, there, there exists such a thing with bounded energy. And then you take a minimizing sequence. OK, once you have a minimizing sequence, what do you need? You need tightness to be able to extract a convergence subsequence that converges to a probability. You want to remain in the class of probability measures. So you need tightness. And you need lower semi-continuity to show that uh, at the limit, you have a, a minimizer. Right? So tightness, why? Well, because of this thing. Because as I said, this thing you can make as large as you want. Uh, outside of a compact set in R2, uh, Rd cross Rd. So if you had some mass outside of that compact set, it would have to be very, very small. And that's exactly what tightness is. Right? Tightness says that there's a compact set that contains most of the mass. So tightness comes from this. And then the lower semi-continuity, that's uh, an argument that's worth mentioning. It's only a few lines. And we're going to use it again later. So the problem with this energy, as always, is this singularity near the diagonal. When, G, when x goes to y, this is not continuous, right? So what you do is you bound it from below. So you introduce m, some big constant. And you say that E of mu n, mu little n, sorry, um, is bigger than the same thing, but where you truncate g of x minus y at level m. So here, this little wedge means the min between the two, okay? So I min, so whenever it goes above m, I cut. And then you continue, keep the rest. So this is certainly true. If you truncate from above, this is, it's all the more true. And now this guy, here now you have a lower semi-continuous function. 
because you basically uh, you take the, the singularity of G and you cut it off. So it becomes, uh, even becomes continuous, in fact. So this one is continuous. Now V is only assumed to be lower semi-continuous, but that's fine for what we want. So the, the sum of all these is lower semi-continuous. Then you take the limit. Now that you have tightness, you can take limits here. And when you have lower semi-continuous functions, you can take, uh, you can take the limit, OK? So the lim half is going to be bigger than that. And now you have the truncated potential. This is what you obtain as little n goes to infinity. OK, but this is true for every m. And then you let m go to infinity on the right-hand side. And by a monotone convergence or whatever, so this is the little trick, okay? Not, nothing major here. But, and this goes back to E of mu. Go back to E of mu, and you have found um, a minimizer. Yeah, so with all the assumptions, we have tightness. We have first that the infimum is not minus infinity. We get tightness. Uh, we get the fact that we can find a bounded a sequence with bounded energy, and then we get tightness. And then with this, we get sort of we recover lower semi-continuity and we're good. Uniqueness is from this uh, convexity um, property that I mentioned. Okay, so now what's left is this Euler-Lagrange equation. So you know that whenever you have a minimization of a functional well, when you have minimization of a function first, right, you can say that at the minimum, the derivative of the function is zero. But that extends to functionals. And this is the sort of basic of calculus of variations, that if you have a functional, you can do something similar to differentiation uh, and say that when you're at the minimum, something is zero. So here, uh, the argument is you can make variations. So what does that mean? If mu is a minimizer, or is the minimizer, so mu h being the minimizer, you want to modify it a little bit and use that as a test, as a test probability that has larger energy by, by uh, comparison, right? So what do I want to do that changes mu h into another probability? Uh, I can make a, com a convex combination with another probability measure, right? That's a good way of remaining in the space of probabilities. So we're going to make what's called variations. By considering a convex combination, so say 1 minus t mu x plus t nu, where nu is some other probability. And I'm going to have to ask that e of nu is finite, because otherwise it doesn't work. So now this thing is a probability. And what you do is you write, OK, that this thing is worse then E of mu x, because that's the minimizer. OK, now you want to expand this thing in t, and eventually let t go to 0, and see what happens. So you have to write out what this is. Okay, so when you write it out, you're going to get terms that are in uh, E of mu x. So you're making some sort of, um, if you want, quadratic expansion, right? E, of e is quadratic. So this is mu egg plus t nu minus mu egg. So you're going to get a t and something like that. Mu egg. Uh, so mu nu minus mu egg.
So if you, if you pay uh, close attention, you find that these are the terms you find. Because uh, first of all, there is symmetry, right? G of x minus y is the same as G of y minus x. And it's a quadratic thing. So you're going to get two of them, but you had a one half. So two times one half here, you don't have the one half anymore. And so you get one thing in the difference and one thing in the, in the basis mu x. So these are the terms plus some terms that are in t squared. And all of that is bigger than e of mu x. Okay? So if you want, you can do it slower in your, uh, in your room up here. A and you find this. And okay, so now we're going to say that when we let t go to 0, uh, this term disappears. We divide by t, right? And then we let t go to 0. But t has to stay positive huh? because we're in, uh, we have this constraint of being a convex combination. So t must stay positive and let t go to 0. So what you find is, uh, is actually an inequality. So you find g x minus y d nu of x d mu x of y. I'm going to break it into two pieces. I'm going to take one piece to the other side. D nu. Agreed? I put all the terms in mu on the left and all the terms in mu x on the right. OK? So now I can rewrite this, because here um, you have g x minus y, and you can sort of make it hit mu x of y, and see this as a convolution. OK, so this convolution defines for me th precisely this h mu x. That's the defini definition of it. And then it gets integrated against nu. And I want to put plus v. And the same on the right hand side, I get h mu x plus v d mu x. Yes? So we write this as a convolution, group terms. And now we're almost done, because you see nu is almost arbitrary. It's a, it's a probability. OK, there is this constraint that it has to have finite e. And on the right-hand side, well, this thing is some constant. Okay, so this is my constant c in the theorem. That's the constant c. And now, formally, what you want to do is you want to say, OK, let me just take a nu equals a Dirac mass at some point. If I take mu, nu equals a Dirac mass, I'm going to find that h mu x plus v at an arbitrary point is always bigger than c, which is what the theorem was saying. OK, so take nu equals Dirac at x, and you find what you want, except, OK, you're not allowed to do that. The reason why you're not allowed to do that is that this thing doesn't have finite energy. So, OK, but you can almost do that. What you're going to do is to say, if this, were, if this wasn't true, quasi everywhere, then there would be a set of capacity 0 where it's not true, or a set of positive capacity where it's not true. And because the set has positive capacity, you could build a measure, that's a probability measure, that lives on that set. And you could, you would, now that guy would have finite energy, and you would get a contradiction. OK, so it's almost that, but it's not quite that. And so you get what you want. And in addition, because this constant is the same as that, if you take this relation, 
and you integrate against d mu x, what you find is that the integral of h mu x plus v d mu x is bigger than c. But that's an equality. That was c. OK, so you integrate. You get equality. It means that this thing must have been an equality mu x almost everywhere. OK, so it must be equality mu x almost everywhere, which was the other statement. OK, so you get the inequality everywhere and then equality on the support as announced. And this is the basic, this basic idea of the proof. OK, so all the details are in the notes. OK, so we have seen that there is an equilibrium measure. And we have seen examples of it and a characterization. So this characterization we're going to use many times. Any questions while, uh, while things dry? So now what we want to do is we want to connect this equilibrium measure with the initial problem, the, the HN problem, right? I told you we're going to jump from here to there. Now, how do we connect? So there is a, there is a framework in which you can, you can phrase the connection, uh, which is called gamma convergence. This is a standard notion in calculus of variations. Um, it allows you to do things at the level of the energies. And then later, we'll do things at the level of large deviations for the Gibbs measure. OK, I wait a little bit. Yeah. Um, so we have strict convexity of the energy. So is it not the case that we should have strict inequality everywhere in the derivation that you had up there before for any measure in u that's not equal to mu x? Um, when I integrated in the last uh, line, when I said let's integrate against mu x, blah, I, I, you mean that outside of the support there is a strict inequality? Okay. That's what you mean? Is that what you mean? Uh, no, I mean, it's in, in the end, it's not directly related to the convexity of the energy. Okay. It's, it, it's somewhat related, but the, the, strict, uh, the strict inequality is not necessarily true, actually. There are cases where it's not. Okay. Um, I will, yeah, maybe I, I can mention that now. Yeah, I can mention that now. Um, so there is something which is called the obstacle problem. So this link with the obstacle problem is for the Coulomb case. So what is the obstacle problem? A priori, it's a different question. You give yourself a function, and its graph is like that, and that's the function psi of x in Rd. OK, so think of something that could have more bumps. I don't know. could be like that. And now you're going to ask to minimize integral of grad h squared over all function h, so in all of our d, such that h is bigger than psi. OK, you need to say almost everywhere. But. So first of all, if you didn't have this constraint, so this is, this is 
a convex problem under constraint, right? So it's still a convex uh, optimization problem. If you didn't have this constraint, do you know how to minimize this? Yes? What are the minimizers? How are they characterized? They are harmonic, right? They are harmonic functions. If you, if you minimize this thing with some conditions at infinity or whatever you, you want, you can make variations like I showed you before. So you can do h plus t u. That's a competitor. It has bigger energy. Expand. Integrate by parts. Use Green's theorem. You're going to find that the Laplacian of h has to be 0. Okay? So functions that are critical points for this, not even minimizers, but critical points, are harmonic functions. Right? This is called the Dirichlet energy. Now there is this constraint. So what is going to happen when you have the constraint? So there is my psi here. And there's going to be my minimizer. Maybe uh, let's say I want, I want to ask that it goes to 0 at infinity. So what's the minimizer going to do? I don't know, something like that. So sometimes it's going to touch this thing that's called the obstacle, right? Obstacle problem. This is the obstacle. You, you're not allowed to go below. Right? So it's going to do something like this. And then touch. And then go up. So there's two regions. Regions where it's touching from here to there and regions where it's not touching, right? So the regions where it's touching, that's called the coincidence set or the contact set. So it's going to be called little omega. So contact set or coincidence set. And what can you say in little omega? Well, you can just say that h equals psi. That's that you know. And what about outside little omega? Well, in the complement of little omega, the, the thing is free to move, right? I could move my graph. I could push it up or down. So I could make variations of the same type of, as here. And what I would find is that the function is harmonic there. Because otherwise, it would contradict the minimality. Right, so I, I can make a little variation here if you want. You can move it, compare, let t go to zero. So here, Laplacian h is zero. Okay, so that's all you can say. There's two sets: the contact set where h is c, and the complement where h is harmonic. And in fact, because this is a convex problem, there's a unique minimizer. And this omega is implicitly defined as the solution to that. There's a unique omega such that this, this all, all this thing works. OK, so seen from above, you have your set omega. Here, h equals psi. And here, h is bigger than psi because it has to be. That's the, that's the requirement, right? h is larger or equal to psi. And this, here, this is the set where it's equal, so outside it's bigger. So now it has to remind you the previous theorem. Because what did we have in the previous theorem? We had h mu v plus v is bigger than some constant or equal in some set, which is the support, which is called sigma. All right, so where is the obstacle here? Here, the obstacle is the function, which is always below h. So psi is c minus v, and h is h mu x. I call it mu v sometimes, mu x, mu v. In the notes, I call it mu v. OK, so if you, if you let h be this h mu x, and psi be this, 
you see that h is bigger than the obstacle. Moreover, when we're outside of the support, what can we say outside mu x? Well, outside mu x, mu x is zero. Uh, outside, sorry, outside sigma. Mu x is zero. So what does that mean for mu x to be zero? Well, you remember that minus Laplacian h mu x, that's essentially mu x. That, that's because of the fact that it's the Coulomb interaction. It's a fundamental solution to the Laplacian. So outside sigma, this is zero. Mu x is harmonic. Yeah. So outside sigma, mu x is zero. So Laplacian mu x, h mu x is zero. So this guy satisfies exactly the two things I told you. It's, it's larger than the obstacle, which is C minus V. And either it touches it, so that's what happens when you have equality here, or it, the function is harmonic. OK, so our solution to the equilibrium measure problem has a potential which solves an obstacle problem. Now, so h mu x solves obstacle problem with obstacle c minus v. And c, OK, so c, you don't really know what c is, but c. It's a bit like a Lagrange multiplier. It's the thing that allows you to find an, an equilibrium measure, which is the Laplacian of H, that is a probability. You want this, this thing to be integral 1. So if you, if you take any obstacle problem and you look at the Laplacian of H, it's going to be supported here and here, but you don't know that it's integral 1. So it happens that if you fix C properly, uh, it's going to be integral 1. So in other words, you see this, this obstacle, what you know is minus v. So now let's start with minus v. Remember, what is our typical v? A v equals x squared. So what is minus v? An inverted parabola. Right? Minus x squared. Now we come with um, an obstacle problem to be above this parabola. So what this says is that there exists a C, which means you can basically shift your parabola up or down, such that if you shift properly, the solution to the obstacle problem uh, will give you something whose Laplacian integrates to 1. So it will give you the equilibrium measure. So I think you can use that. So first of all, the equilibrium measure has been, uh, it's a problem that's been well studied. The obstacle problem, it's even better studied. So this, in this particular Coulomb case, people have studied this, uh, this obstacle problem quite a bit. And the central name for this is Louis Caffarelli. Um, there's been other celebrated works on this. And so, for instance, now they're able to tell you a lot of things about the geometry of the contact set. And what is the contact set? Right, this is sigma. The contact set in generic cases is the same as the support of the equilibrium measure. And I told you before, it's annoying. We don't really know what the support is. But OK, this is another interpretation for the support. The support is the set where the function is going to touch the obstacle. And the kind of things they can tell you is what is the boundary looking like? For instance, can there be cusps like what I'm drawing here? You see these things are called cusps, this little uh, lack of C1 uh, regularity. The answer is yes, there can be cusps. They can even tell you how generic it is uh, from a recent work of uh, Figali, Serra, and Ross Oton. We can tell you that for almost every C, there are no cusps. So if you shift a little bit your obstacle up or down, you will, the cusps will disappear. They are not generic. 
But they can happen. Like you can have things like this. So they, they study a lot of questions about the regularity of this uh, boundary. And so this can give intuition for uh, the question that one of you was asking me earlier. Can there be a hole? Can there be this or that? Now, if you think in terms of the obstacle problem, you see, for instance, if your obstacle is like this, means your, your potential, which is the opposite of that, has two wells, right? It's likely that you're going to have two connected components or a hole in the middle here. You can sort of start to guess it now from this, uh, I would say, this mechanics uh, intuition, right? Think of it as, the, the good way to think of it is, you have an obstacle here and you're coming with one of these uh, uh, plastic films that you can use to wrap your sandwiches, you know, like this. Uh, these thin films, right? So you come and you, you want to touch the obstacle and then you pull and you see how, what's the contact set? It's, uh, so it's really like an elastic sheet with a constraint to be above the obstacle. Um, and, and, and so there's a number of things you can prove this way, like how many connected components, is there going to be holes and things like that? There was a question. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. There are some fairly fine properties, yes. So, and, but of course, this is for the Coulomb case. Very nice. Very nice in the Coulomb case, you know a lot of things. Now, if you're not in the Coulomb case, suddenly, instead of having the Laplacian, here you have the fractional Laplacian. Because uh, this is the relation between H and mu, is that minus a fractional Laplacian of H is equal to, okay, so what you can do is you can also study the Ries cases when S is between D minus two and D with this point of view, and now you're gonna have minus Laplacian to the D minus S over two H mu X equals C D S Mu uh, and instead of having this uh, obstacle problem, so instead of minimizing the Dirichlet energy h bigger than psi, there's something else that replaces that, and which is a sort of fractional version. So I, 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 I wrote some details in the notes. But there is some analog, if you want, for it, where you can again get some sort of intuition for, um, for what the equilibrium measure is going to be like with your sort of thin film analogy. So to give you an example, you remember the uh, semicircle law in uh, one dimension? So the obstacle problem in, in this case would be the following. You have a 1D line, and imagine you come with a, a wire that has exactly the shape of uh, an inverted parabola. Okay, so you have a wire shape of an inverted parabola, but only on a, on one, in one direction. And now you come with your thin film above it, and you pull, and what you're going to obtain is some sort of crest. Right? So the thing is going to follow the wire and then start to abruptly go down like sharp like this. And eventually it will lift off the wire. Uh, when you go far in this direction, it will lift off above the wire. And you'll find that it's, it's actually coinciding only on a certain set. And then after that, it's lifting off. So there's going to be a potential H mu like that. And what is, the, what is the mu, the equilibrium measure? It will correspond to the jump in the normal derivative of the height of your film. So if you look at the height of your film, it goes up and then it has an abrupt jump, goes down. So the difference between these two derivatives is the intensity of the equilibrium measure. So just to give you a vague idea of an example, this is called the thin obstacle problem. 
So instead of having an obstacle that occupies all space, it occupies only a sub-dimension, um, a sort of co-dimension one. Uh, it's a co-dimension one obstacle. If you want. Okay, so this is all I'm going to tell you on the equilibrium measure. There's more to know about it, but this is enough. Any uh, questions on this? Um, for the um, optical, optical problem, um, is the minimizer always concave or is it? Uh, the function h? Yeah. Uh, like no, not, not necessarily. However, what is true is that its Laplacian has a sign. Because whenever the Laplacian is not zero, it touches the obstacle, and you're going to find that the difference between the function and the uh, yeah the difference between the function and its obstacle has a, a Laplacian that has a sign. So there's a certain sign, but there's no concavity. No, that's in general it's not true. Okay. So now back to the original problem. We have a problem of looking at HN. OK, so let me rewrite what it is. So you have the integral on the complement of the diagonal. I write it with the empirical measure here. So how can we connect with the other problem, the problem of the function, function E? Well, you can say two things. One is that if Hn of Xn is bounded above by a constant times n squared, so basically if, if this thing in the bracket is bounded above, then up to extraction, the empirical measure converges as n goes to infinity to some probability mu. And the limaf of 1 over n squared hn of xn is bigger than E of mu. That's number one. Number two, for every mu probability such that E of mu is finite, There exists xn such that mu and hat converge to mu, and the lim soup Okay, can you read? So this one is called, uh, in the language of gamma convergence, it would be called gamma lim inf. And this one would be called gamma lim sup. And this thing would be called a recovery sequence. So how do we prove this, this one? In fact, this one is very similar to the proof of existence 
of a minimizer of E that I gave you before. Because if Hn of Xn is less than Cn squared, by the same argument I told you before, because G plus V plus V is bounded below and goes to infinity at infinity, you're going to get tightness. Yeah, so you cannot have too much mass at infinity. Okay, so proof. You're going to again have tightness. If you had mass at infinity, it would get to a contradiction. And how do you do the gamma lim inf? It's the same argument. You truncate at a level m. At m. Okay, so what happens when you truncate at m? You say, okay, the integral of gx minus y plus v of x plus v of y d mu n hat, d mu n hat. I don't write of x of y, but it's, it's implicit, right? How can you bound it from below? Well, you can bound it from below by the thing where you truncate at level m. And here, if you truncate at level m, you can put back the diagonal. So remember, this is the diagonal. You can put it back, but you have to co correct because what happens on the diagonal is going to be m d mu n hat d mu n hat. So actually, it's going to be this minus m over n that you have to, to subtract. So it's the mass that would be carried by the diagonal here. OK, then you take the limit, the lim inf as m n goes to infinity. And you get that this is bounded below by the same thing with g truncated, but with a d mu d mu. And then this goes to 0 as n goes to infinity. And then finally, you let m go to infinity. And here, you converge to e of mu. OK, so this, this relation here, it's essentially the same proof as the uh, lower semi-continuity plus tightness. This one, um, there's many different proofs for this, but I want to give you one that's is a, is a little bit cute and uh, that we will possibly use later, or same idea. It's kind of a probabilistic proof. So here you're given a measure mu, and you want to reconstruct points that approximate the measure. So there's different ways of doing that. You could think, okay, I'm going to look at my measure. I'm going to assume by some density argument that it's compactly supported, that it's nice. I'm going to shop into boxes. I'm going to see how much mass there is in each box, and I'm going to try to put a point for each box or something like that. Right? That seems, seems reasonable, and you can do that. So let me show you the probabilistic argument once the board dries. Any questions in the meantime? What I should do is I should save time by starting to erase. OK, so in order to avoid a construction like that, what we're going to do is to integrate hn of xn against d mu tensor n times. 
So we're going to integrate over Rd to the power n. So in some sense, it's like you draw your points according to mu tensor n times, and you compute the average energy for that. And the hope is that in there, you're going to find a configuration that has good energy. Right? What you want here is the energy of the configuration. Of course, there's a 1 over n squared here. You want the energy to be not too large. And you want the configuration, you remember, to look like mu, to approximate mu. OK, so you, you compute the average energy uh, according to this measure. And so let's write out what that is. So this is an educational computation. So what happens when you do that? Let's look at the first terms. So here we have pairs of points. So what kind of terms are we going to get? So I'm going to get, like, let's say, a term g of x1 minus x2 gets integrated against mu of x1, mu of x2, mu of x3, mu of x4. OK, so all the variables that are after 2, they don't intervene. So mu of x3, mu of x3, I can just integrate them out because mu is a probability. So they will give me 1. OK, then I'm going to get g of x1 minus g of x3, d mu of x1, d mu of x3. The other ones I integrate out. And etc., etc. So in fact, they are all the same, because if you relabel the variables, g of x1 minus g of x2, or g of x1 minus g of x3, it's the same. Then you get g of x2 minus g of x3. OK, so the question is, how many pairs of variables that are distinct do you have? So n, n minus 1. n choices for the first one, n minus 1 choices for the other one. So you have n, n minus 1 identical terms. And what are they equal to? So this is equal to n, n minus 1. That's the number of terms, divide by 2. And what do I get? I just get g. And now I'm going to call it x minus y, d mu of x, d mu of y. OK, so these are all my identical terms. I have n, n minus 1 of them. Right now, with this one, it's even easier because I have v of x1, d mu of x1, and then I integrate out the other variables. And then I have v of x2, integrate out the other variables. So in fact, here we have just n terms that are identical. So here we get n squared because there is an n in front. So there is n squared times just this integral. Right? So what is the, uh, the value of all this? Well, it's almost e of mu, although not quite. So this you can compute. It's e, so it's n squared times e of mu. So here, if I had n squared, this would be exactly that, because I would have n squared over 2 times that plus n squared times that. But there is this minus 1 half here that's due to the self-interaction. So it's this minus n over 2. Times something. Um, let me just check if I did this in the right order. Yes. OK. So this is, this is not bad, because if you see, uh, this thing is kind of a lower order term compared to that one. So compared to n squared, this is a negligible term. 
And this is telling me that when I average hn, in fact, I get, uh, if, and I divide by n squared, I get e of mu. So there is a configuration in there that has the energy that I want. Uh, the only problem is to find it near mu. I want my configuration to look like mu. So we're going to break this into two pieces. So it's going to be the integral uh, over configurations such that the empirical measure is close to mu, so it's in some ball for some metric. You pick your metric of radius epsilon. So let's do 1 over n squared hn d mu tensor n times. OK, so this is going to be equal to the integral everywhere. minus the integral for the cases where you're not near mu. So the empirical measure is not. OK, so same thing. And now this guy, I have an estimate for it. So this is equal to e of mu v. And I divide by n squared, so I have minus 1 over 2n something. Uh, sorry, e of mu. E of mu. And now this guy, OK, to give you the summary, I want a bound from above. So I need a bound from below for this. And, um, and this thing I can bound. No, actually, I want a bound from, yeah, I want a bound from below. So this thing, actually, you can show this is bounded below. Why is it bounded below? Because the first point of my gamma convergence thing, the gamma leave inf, was telling me that hn over n squared is bounded below by e of mu. And e has a finite infimum, so e is bounded below. So this is actually bounded below, okay, independently of n. So that, that is true by first point. OK, and so now I can bound this above by some constant times the integral mu n hat not in b mu epsilon d mu tensor n times. And now I'm going to appeal to probability a little bit. If you have iid random variables of law mu, what is the probability that their empirical measure is not close to mu, or it goes to zero. That's, that's the law of large numbers, right? If you take, if you take uh, IID random variables with law mu, the empirical measure looks like mu. Right? So this thing is little o of 1 as n goes to infinity by law of large numbers for the most vanilla law of large numbers for empirical measures. OK, so now we'll conclude because you see here, because this integral is bounded by, so this whole thing is bounded by e of mu plus something small. And so it means there exists some guy in there, in this ball, for which this thing is bounded uh, by that. OK, so we conclude point two. The gamma lip soup recovery sequence. Oh, it's time to stop soon. Um, so it's good. It's a good time to stop. I just want to make one conclusion from this. So you see, you can bound from below the hn over n squared by e of mu. And then you can find a recovery sequence. So in particular, this implies the following theorem that if you take minimizers, they converge to the equilibrium measure as claimed. So theorem, if hn, uh, if xn minimizes hn, then 
the empirical measure converges to the equilibrium measure and moreover the mean of hn over n squared is equivalent to the mean of e which is just the e of mu x. So why? Because if it wasn't converging to the equilibrium measure it would be converging to something else. <laughs> That's true, right? <laughs> and this something else would have more energy than the equilibrium measure because the equilibrium measure is the unique minimizer. So it would be above, right, in terms of the energy. So it would be somewhere there. Uh, so what, where is our mu, uh, our empirical measure? It's converging somewhere there. It's, it's going there. But now the equilibrium measure is, is has strictly less energy E. So by point two, I can find a recovery sequence that approximates the equilibrium measure and that has energy kind of below this one. So if you compare it to that guy, it would be a, a competitor. It would actually have less energy HN contradiction. But you can make a proof like that in two lines. Okay, so this proves this, because this one's the best, it proves the convergence, and also it proves this by putting together point one and point two, and so now we understand what's happening for minimizers, and tomorrow we'll see what's happening uh, also with temperature. That's it.